uh, it's it's bad for 2023 for trucking, man. It's bad. Oh, let me tell you. It, it, yeah. It's it's bad, man. It's bad. It's it's yeah. not a it's not a good look. Alley pants, everybody. Before we go into um, what's going on uh, with your situation, um, what what's your whole thoughts about 2023 in trucking? What, what what's your thoughts about it? I think it's going to be a really hard year for everybody in one way or another. I think we're all just going to have to hang on the best that we can, and we're going to have to adapt to the changing landscape. I think trucking is going through a bit of a renaissance in and of itself, um, which is to say I think it's going to be a consolidation of mega carriers. Uh, And we're just going to have to learn how to work within that system and hang on the best that we can until things change. Do you do you think it's going to ever change? Because this year alone, I mean, we we had 20, 30, 40 year companies that went belly up. Yeah, I think it has to change. Right. Uh, but I don't know that it's necessarily going to change for the better, per se, for drivers anyway. Uh like I said, I think the writing is on the wall that there's a massive consolidation into mega carriers going on currently. Um, but with that, I think we've also seen, uh, well, I guess I really can't say that. I think there's still opportunity for owner operators uh, to come around, but I think that it just is going to have to be a lot more competitive. It's going to have to, you know, we're going to have to start competing with each other more than we have had to before. Well, uh, I the company I drive for, we we definitely seen an influx of freight, uh, in particularly when yellow shut down. I mean, I I seen maybe I, I can't give a actual percentage because I'm I'm not in the office or nothing like that. But me as a driver, I have seen more uh, places that we went to this year after yellow shut down than i did last year like we we picked up a few uh a few freight carriers uh along the way now i would tend to think that would be a a good thing like hey i mean (laughs) mega carrier shut down everybody still need to move their freights (laughs) what i'm saying so i I would i would think i would think that's a good thing but it's um it's a bad thing uh for drivers because i i talk to a lot of drivers i'm watching a lot of videos and i'm i'm seeing a lot of things that uh the the quote unquote driver shortage is just is just the same now because you got drivers that's coming out of school uh and they and they can't get a job because the companies like Swift, Snyder and the rest of them that will bring them in is not bringing them in because they they extended their offers to to the experienced drivers that got laid off or they got or they got replaced by by the companies like yellow and metal lark and the rest of them the, those drivers that got like 10 15 20 years they they extending their offers to them what, what's your thoughts about that yeah i think it's uh gonna be really hard for drivers because as competition among the carriers diminishes that means that they're not going to have to pay us nearly as much uh which means that our wages go down i have noticed that a lot of the older drivers just want out they don't want to go find other jobs uh they just want out of trucking altogether so there's going to be a changing of guard there and that is also going to drive wages down and so while it would seem like you know some companies yes are flourishing because they're picking up that business from these places that are going under which is many many places medium-sized small and 
some large uh, companies have gone under, the the reality of the matter is that this is not good for wages. With experienced drivers leaving the force and with consolidation of freight under just a few hands, that means that we're not going to be making nearly as much money and that our runs are not going to be the same. However, it could also mean that our scheduling might change. Uh, I, I'm not overly optimistic on that. It just depends on cost effectiveness, but I don't see it as being a good prognosis for drivers. What are you waiting on? Four cappuccinos. Four cappuccinos. Let's go. So, Ali, um, you you just made a, a TikTok, um, and I, I caught wind of it. Um, unfortunately, you 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 was hit. Um, it sounds as though you've been with this company, this particular company, for uh, for a while. You got comfortable with it, as we all do when we get comfortable with with companies that we actually like. I, I know a lot of people be like, "Well, what's a good company out here?" Well, it's a, a company that that you feel is good and that you like. That's that's a good company, and you felt that the company that you was with was a good company, but lo and behold, I mean, lo and behold, um, once the domino effect start falling at one place, it trickles down and affects others. So go in and uh, tell us what happened. Yeah, you bet. So my situation is just a little bit different uh, from like the yellow situation, just because of who we hauled for. So the company that I worked for was Matheson Transport, and I really enjoyed my time there. I worked there for like three years. Um, they're great people from top to bottom, uh, and they were really good to me. But we hauled U.S. mail, and the USPS is doing a massive overhaul on how they do business, and they're bringing all of their trucking in-house. And they're going to go to more of a hub and spoke model and make people travel farther to get their mail rather than doing continuous line haul service where they're bringing the mail to lots of little communities. They're going to make those communities come and get their mail from bigger distribution centers. And part of that shift, uh, basically, for all intents and purposes, it's looking like it's probably going to put the company out of business altogether. Uh, it has already severely crippled the company and several others as well. There are many, many other companies who haul mail uh, because mail is generally speaking an exclusive gig. You don't really haul anything else if you haul mail. And so a lot of those companies that have been exclusively hauling mail for many, many years are now going under or having to transition to regular freight. And they're not equipped for, you know, freight right now. They're, they're, it's going to create a really difficult situation for them to switch over into freight and into long haul and to completely shift their business model. So for me, what that meant was that I got laid off because my route was consolidated into the USPS instead of continuing with my company. And... Uh, so now I have to move on. I found another job and it's, it's going to be a good transition. Thank goodness. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if you're working for a mail carrier, you know, your days are numbered. They are saying by 2025, they're going to have everything in the house. Even, even though you just said that you found another, uh, uh, company, uh, easy transition, but how how hard is it to to start over like literally i mean you you let's just say i I don't know how much you was making but i'm just i'm just guessing like maybe you was making and i'm just saying on the low end you you probably made more because of your experience but let's say on the low end like 50 cent a mile and and now you have to uh transition to another place to see if they even match that or better how how hard is it uh to to find another company to match what you're making that was really the the most difficult part because if i chose to go over the road then it wouldn't be nearly as difficult 
um, I would probably end up with a raise out of it just because I would be running more and because um, of the nature of over the road, right? But I needed to stay more local and regional for my personal needs. And it's always tough, especially when you live in more rural areas, to find jobs that will pay you as well as a national company will. Uh, and so it, it was tough. It was really tough to root out what jobs were going to work best uh, for me. And I was afraid I was going to have to take a pay cut. And I was trying to figure out how I would do that. As a matter of fact, I signed up to do DoorDash on the side so that if I found a job that couldn't pay me quite enough, I would just work a second job so that I could make my bills. Oh my God, DoorDash. Let's, let's not. Yeah, not exciting. <laughs> Let's let's not let's let's not talk about DoorDash. I mean, I I seen all of the videos. Uh, if you want to make some extra money, my friend told me to get into DoorDash and look at all the money and the free time I'm making. But in reality, we got DoorDashers refusing to take uh to take dashes because of of them not making no money so what's what's the consensus there like i mean the 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 app and the and the video shows all these happy go lucky people making 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 money and then in reality you you got dashers complaining about not getting tipped well and not getting money well I, have you have yeah, you door da time. have you door dash before I have. I've had to use it to get through, right? And that's the whole point of DoorDash is you just use it to get through or maybe for a little extra cash. It's not a living. It's not meant to be a living. And if you do it for a long a period of time and you, you know, treat it as though it, you're going to make a living at it, you actually lose money over the long term. But it's good for, you know, a quick little burst of, of cash that you need a, a quick cash influx if you have a bill or something that's coming due and you don't quite have it. So, and the appeal to DoorDash, for me anyway, is just that I can make my own schedule, which means that I can work around whatever schedule at whatever new job I was going to get, right? So I would have a fallback if I needed it. Um, it's not an exciting fallback by any means. I don't want to work two jobs. That's part of the reason I got into trucking again. Uh but I was prepared to do it if I had to because the market is that rough at the moment. Uh, however, I got lucky. I found a job where I'm going to get a slight raise and it's going to meet my needs. But it's always a little, I got to tell you, as far as the transition question, it's always a little scary because you never know what you're walking into as far as um, coworkers and as far as the dynamic of the company, Right. And so you start over and you go in and you have a great attitude and you're ready to hit the road. And it's always a little nerve wracking because you don't know if they lied to you, if the recruiter completely lied to you about everything. And now all of a sudden you're getting right in the door and everything's changing. You don't know if the people there are going to be welcoming, if you're going to get along with everybody. You know, you just don't know. And that unknown is very scary. That's the part of starting over that I don't like. Going back to DoorDash, um, I mentioned the bar part about tipping. Um, are, are you one of those drivers that put tips over the, I mean, over everything in your decision to accept the dash that comes through on your app? Yeah. Yes, 100%. I look at it this way. It's very much like trucking because I have to pay for my vehicle expenses, right? I have to pay for the gas and the maintenance on my vehicle. So I'm not going to accept anything that's going to pay me less than a dollar a mile because I'm not guaranteed to have an order that will get me back to the area I want to be. So I'm when I DoorDash, I'm really picky about what I'll accept because I'm not going to take something that's going to take me on a 22 mile round trip. That's only going to pay me, end up paying me 20 cents a mile. 
You see what I'm saying? I lose money in that scenario. So you have to weigh out how much the tip is versus how much the mileage is. And you have to set your number. This is what I'll accept because that way I know I'll still make money. I've seen uh, an article and it was talking about dashers and how they how they feel about not being tipped they show uh some places that got like like uh food that's already ready to go that's all built up and nobody ain't taking them because it's like it's it's not worth it to them but then you got they 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 went and actually talked to the people that actually put the orders in and one of the guy in the video simply said no i feel like tipping is it's their job i mean they, see this this is the disconnect that i that i see with ride share uh dashers and the rest of the people that that i see through through technology apps such as doordash uber lyft grubhub and the rest of them the whole disconnect between the people that think that these people work for them is crazy and when i used to when i oh no i was saying when i used to uh uber and lyft people really felt some kind of way like oh well you you work for uber no no i don't work for uber i'm a i'm an independent contractor that's that's what it is this is my car this is my time so that's the whole disconnect but go ahead what you was about to say yeah i think part of the disconnect also is that when people see the delivery fee they assume that that delivery fee or any of those fees that they see in the app before they put a tip in, they assume that we are receiving that. And so they see, well, I just paid, you know, $10 in delivery fee and other fees and taxes. And now you want me to tip you on top of that. And it's like, but we don't get that $10. We get maybe $2 of that $10. And that's my wage. I don't get a wage outside of that. So your tip is my wage. And whatever DoorDash or Uber, any of these other gig economy jobs do is they pay me a little extra on top of whatever the tip wage is. So if you don't tip, that means you want me basically to do it for free. And I can't afford to do that. I'm not here because I can do charity. You know, I'm not here because I can do this for charity. I'm here because I need to make money. So I think that's the disconnect is people think they see those fees. And they think that we're receiving them when we're not. Do you think? Do you think because they're not being, uh, they're not being explained well? I think that's part of it, right? Uh, I really do believe that's part of it. But I think the other part of it is people don't care. They don't understand. I think a lot of people don't understand how these gig gig work shops operate they make so much money in every direction they charge the people they charge the restaurants and so forth uh they add extra money onto their items right so anything that you order on doordash is going to be more expensive just per item than it would be in the restaurant and then on top of that they add fees and taxes we don't know what the fees are we just know taxes we can gauge right sales tax and then on top of that, they add a, del a delivery fee and they paint it out like, for whatever reason, I don't think they deliberately do this, but it just comes across that the actual person delivering your food is making all of that money when the reality is they're maybe making 5% of that entire exchange. And that's why the tips are so important. Uh, give me one of these, will you? And a large coffee, leave some room for milk. Ready?
in that same article that I was watching, uh, they did a expose on Uber drivers as well, Uber and Lyft drivers as well. Uh, again, I, I was an Uber driver way back in the day when it first started. Like in the beginning, I, I will always say, and that's what anything in in the beginning, it was always good. It's it's always good in the beginning because it's a brand new system. Everybody is getting into it. Everybody is getting a feel for it. Same thing with the with the app itself they they trying to gauge how everybody would accept them try to gauge how much money that they can get out of it versus how much that they can give you now again in the beginning the money was good i ain't gonna cap uh, the money was good but as time passed and uh, and and the apps tend to figure out more and more ways how to cut costs and squeeze a dime here a nickel there now it's to the point where the money ain't that great like it used to be you you got to work two times as hard as you would when you first when 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 you first started way back in the day um is that like what doordash have have done over the over the years since you have done it yeah they have restructured many times in terms of they've made it to where they can take more of the pie right and when i say they take more of the pie they find ways to take it out of their retailers and out of their drivers they don't necessarily charge more to the customer because they know that's bad for business and customers won't use their service so they just find different ways to take money out of our pocket. Uh, a few years ago, they went through and they revamped what they would pay per order. And where it used to be, you would get a guaranteed 375 per order. They knocked it down. I think it was like to 250 was the only guarantee you would have for an order. And 375 was the best you were going to do out of their delivery fees. So if you paid a $5.99 delivery fee, if a customer paid a $5.99 delivery fee, the best that we would see out of that was $3.75. And most of the time on that, we might see $2.50 of it. Mm. It's just like how how it used to be. We we used to actually see, as Uber drivers, we, we would see how much the customer would pay versus how much we would see, how much will we get after it? Like, for example, I mean, at, at one point, we was actually getting what the customer was paying uh, with, the, with the subtraction of maybe 20% or something like that. So if a customer pays $10, 20% of that, we would get the eight. But now, nowadays, with the restructure and everything now, the drivers don't even see that uh, what the customer pay, but they could still see what they probably get. So if the customer now pays $10, then you will probably only get like three or $4 out of that 10 now. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, it is absolutely crazy, right? When you think about it, because the truth of the matter is that the drivers bear all the overhead. The drivers have to pay for the vehicles, they have to pay for the gas, they have to put in the labor to keep the vehicle nice, they have to do the job, they have to, you know, have the customer service. So the drivers are putting in all the work. So drivers should be making the 70% and the company should be making the 30% for running the app and for getting the customers and marketing those things. Sure, that's fine, but instead they flip it. Now, the company is keeping the 70% for running the app and getting the customers, and the drivers who do all of the manual labor and carry all of the overhead are only getting, you know, that 20 or 30%. And that's why it's a problem. Wow. Let's flip it, though. Let's, let's flip it to trucking because I, 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 talked, to some, I talked to someone about uh, not getting paid all the miles uh, when it comes to zip to zip trucking figure out ways to 
cut corners as well. Uh, take a little bit of money here, take a little bit of money there out of driver's pockets. Now, my thing was always the fact that the company would always say, hey, yeah, we'll treat you like family. And I, I'm, I'm like, no, no, you don't. No, I, I don't want to be treated like you're a family. I, I want to treat me like an employee and just pay me my money. That's, that's what I'm like. With zip to zip, you're not getting all the miles. Say, for example, zip to zip is like, like 400 miles. But you only getting paid uh-huh. three hundred and fifty because it's zip uh-huh. to zip. Well, what about the extra? Uh-huh. What about what, what about the extra fifty that I drove? Oh, well, you gotta <laughs> you gotta chop that up as a loss. Okay. No, I don't. You <laughs> I you <sure> do not. <laughs> you 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 get a reefer load and you're you you being hemmed up at the at the uh, shipper and receiver and. You got to give them two hours in order to start getting paid the third hour for detention. <laughs> you you, you got to chop that up as a loss. Or how about uh, how about getting paid for uh, each stop? Well, you get paid for each stop that you do when you deliver. So say like you have four deliveries. The first stop is null and void, so you get paid for the for the three stops. But what if you got a but what if you got like two or three pickups after that? You you don't get paid for that. I gotta be honest with you. Like let me be just like super honest with you. The way that trucking manipulates people's pay is super shady to me. In my personal opinion, I think that Truckers should either be paid percentage of each load or they should be paid by the hour. A, because we should be paid for everything that we do. B, because just because we're not driving, like on the road, doesn't mean that we're home with our families living our lives. We give up such a huge chunk of our lives for these companies that just to pay us for that time by itself is important. And I think that we deserve to be paid for that. But that's just me. I no, it's not just you. I agree. I agree. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I feel that we should be paid. And when a company tells you, it's a gray area when they do say this. But when they say all miles, it's all their miles that they calculate. That's where a lot of people fail to understand. Like what you said is. It's all miles paid. No, 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 no. It's all miles well, that we calculate. Why do they need to specify it? Why do they need to specify it all? Of course it's all miles. Why wouldn't it be all miles? If I'm on the road for you, why wouldn't I get paid for every mile I'm on the road for you? It's weird. Yeah. Why do you need to say that? You know? So, yeah. I mean, I it, it's I agree with you. It is shitty the way the trucking industry is structured to to make it make it hard for the for the for the driver i mean i i don't think it's i I don't think it's that hard for the owner operator because he can definitely uh finagle all miles from point a to point b and in and everything else but as far as a company driver goes such as myself we we're, we're pretty much stagnant in 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 the companies that we work for so if we work for a company that that does zip to zip, hey, is is nothing that we can do. I mean, this should be something that we can do. Yeah, I'm sorry. We don't have the same uh, negotiating power that owner-operators do, right? Owner-operators can negotiate their bottom line and what's going to be acceptable for them. Company drivers have a lot less negotiating power because our only real play is either you suit my needs in this way or I'm going to go find somebody else. But that's not a guarantee that there's going to be somebody else out there who will do it either. And as everything consolidates into these bigger mega carriers into just less and less hands, we're going to have less and less options to be able to say that. Because they're going to come back at us and say, you know, like Swift is going to come back at us and say, well, fine, go work for, uh, you know, whatever the other mega carrier is, CRST. 
they're going to give you the same deal we're giving you. We know because we just got off the phone with them and said, hey, if we all offer the same thing, then they got to stay. Yeah, it is sad that I talked to one of the recruiters and she was like, well, hey, if you and she was straight up, she, if, if you making more than what we're offering, then your best bet is to stay because not many companies is offering more than X amount of cent a mile. So if you making a little bit more than that, then I, I, I don't see no point of you even leaving because basically all you're going to be doing is is starting all over. And then when you start all over, it's going to be a, a uphill battle, especially if you're coming into a company like a mega carrier that got like a hundred people per fleet manager. You're going to end up coming on YouTube Hey, you put a lot of milk into it, less than a chance of stomach distress. I can't be worrying about every little thing. In the middle of the night, complaining about your three, four hundred dollar checks. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so, so yeah, man. I mean, again, it's 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 whew, it's crazy. I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And that's rough. I think uh, those of us who are out here for the long of it are just going to have to hang on the very best that we can. And if and when it doesn't work, we'll just have to adapt. That's exactly, uh, that's exactly what we're going to have to do. Allie, everybody. Um, happy holidays. What, what, what are we cooking this? Uh, what are we cooking tomorrow? Or are we cooking? I'm cooking nothing. I don't like cooking. And I am not a big... Honestly, I don't really like Thanksgiving. Um, I don't like Thanksgiving dinner even. Because I, I'm like, who put whose idea was it to put every starch known to man on the same plate? Uh, so usually for Thanksgiving, I'll just watch some movies and maybe have like, you know, some uh, charcuterie board or something like that. Yeah, the dynamics of of Thanksgiving for people such as myself, where the matriarchs has passed on, the matriarchs that or that was doing the food preparations. I used to watch my mom's, my grandfather, my 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 grandfather's wife. Yeah, that part. Um, they they all be in the kitchen preparing and it was such a it was such a a feast uh back in the day but everybody has went home to their heavenly home and and again i we me and my wife and my my kid we kind of kept the the tradition because my wife would do thanksgiving dinner and stuff like that but since me and her divorce, the dynamic, like I said, the dynamics is changing. My mom, she, moms ain't gonna cook no more. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's just um, oh the the holidays period, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and all like that. But I still want to be off. Don't get me wrong. I hey, since my yeah. dynamics <laughs> change, I still I, I don't want to be out here. I I did that when I was a rookie. I did that when I was a rookie. But now. Nah, I don't. I don't want to be out here, so I I want to go home. I I want to be home. Hundred percent, what I say too. I, just because I'm not celebrating with family, doesn't mean I want to be working. Exactly, and with some places, you got to let them know months in advance. Like, bro, yeah, I, I I'm gonna need my 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 Christmas and Thanksgiving off. But if you don't let us know, yeah. we we don't know, so we gonna put you on a board. Like, no, no, I'm I'm letting you now. <laughs> so.